Hi guys, and welcome to episode 76 of the Crochet Cakes podcast. My name is Clarissa Beth, and you can find me anywhere on social media as Crochet Cakes. This is a podcast about, I would say, the fiber arts. There is lots of crochet today, but sometimes there's knitting and also sewing. Now, the world has changed a lot since the last time I sat down and I talked to you guys um, two weeks ago now. I have turned 30. I had my birthday on the 12th of March and I made it to 30, guys. So on a personal life note, it's been good. On a universe earth note, it's been bad. Um, I know life has turned to be a lot more stress-inducing and just uncertain and it's just making a lot of us very very anxious especially if we watch the news a lot um, I have been through something similar it wasn't um, such a strong isolation because when Hurricane Maria hit the island of Puerto Rico I was with my family we were all together so even though for about 10 days, we were pretty isolated from the rest of the world and we had no way of knowing how people were doing. Um, we weren't alone and, and that made, made all the difference because you have like your own personal cheering team with you. And you know, as much as we say humans have evolved, we're pack animals. We feel safer in numbers. Not all of us. Some of us really do feel safer just being by ourselves, which is perfectly fine. But in this um, age of technology, isolation doesn't really mean what it used to mean. As long as you've got electricity and your cell reception, you can use social media to interact with other people. And that is kind of my goal. I've um, really been looking for ways to interact with you guys more just to keep you guys company, maybe even inspire you. Um, so to that effect, I have been participating a lot on Instagram. I've been making use of Instagram stories just to share with you what I've been doing in my daily life. I'm not vlogging because my life is just not that interesting that I can come up in front of a camera every single day to share something with you. But I can do 15 minutes, 15 seconds or one minute Instagram stories and make it all look good and it's just a way of, like I said, keeping you guys company and interacting with you guys more because I think, you know, that's, that's part of social media, right? It's meant to bring us together even though we're far, far apart. Um, so in terms of my life, I... Um, I'm still going to work. Our owner has decided that he will not close for the foreseeable future. Um, if the government, of course, forces him to close, he will. But if not, he really won't. And it's not, it's not really that good. But um, you just, you know, wash your hands. Uh, Edison and I come straight home from work. We disinfect our cars, our cell phones. Uh, we wash our hands, disinfect the doorknobs, and just try to be as clean as possible. Which you should try to be anyways, because who wants to live with so many germs around the house? But at the same time, isn't germ exposure good for the immune system? Not COVID-19, obviously. Just speaking of general, less harmful germs. Anyway. <laughs> Um, that is what I wanted to share with you um, in terms of plans of how I'm going to deal with the COVID-19 crisis. If we are um, isolated for 14 days, then I do have plans for that as well. I was talking with mom yesterday and I was telling her that instead of buying fruits and vegetables, I wanted to plan ahead and plant my fruits and vegetables. And I was telling her that I needed to go buy seeds and I was um, FaceTiming mom. So she just looks at me and says, you do have all those vegetables in your fridge. You could just use those seeds. And I don't know why that didn't occur to me. I guess you guys can now tell that I am not used to growing anything because hello, all those seeds in your vegetables, you, you can take them out and dry them and use them to plant. 
Now, Florida dirt is, is not the best dirt to grow things. Um, citruses grow very well. That's why we're Florida is the orange state. We do have a tangerine tree that's never gone anywhere. So that's a bit disappointing. It doesn't even have flowers. I wasn't expecting fruits in the first year, but at least a little flowering here and there. Nope, nothing. But one of Edison's coworkers did give us a key, key, bunch of key limes. So we're drying out the seeds and hopefully get a key lime tree going in the next couple of weeks. Supposedly it takes three weeks to germinate. We'll see. Um, I do not have a green thumb by any stretch of the imagination. My peace lily is dying. And for those of you that are familiar with plants, peace lilies are one of the hardest um, house plants to kill. So, yes. But enough talking about how I do not have any sort of green thumb. I think I can now move on to what I'm good at, which is crochet. <laughs> or at least I like to think I'm good at it. But anyway, I am wearing a t-shirt. Yeah, I would call this a t-shirt that I've worn quite a few times before and a lot of people have asked me where I got it from or, or at least the pattern. Well, mom actually crocheted this shirt and it is a pattern from DMC. So it is a paid for pattern. If I'm not mistaken, she bought the pattern and yarn in a kit, but I do not recall which one it is. I do remember that the model is wearing this shirt, looking down and wearing a hat. The things you remember, right? So that's what I'm wearing in terms of crochet today. And in terms of finished objects, I have a couple of things to share with you. If you follow my blog, you will already have seen and read the details for the, uh, what I'm going to share with you now because it is my Vintage Waves sock pattern. And I called the blog post Socks Remade because the Vintage Waves sock pattern was written to use fingering weight yarn, um, very thin fingering weight yarn. It was dyed by Little Bean Loves, um, who's Kayleen. She's a yarn dyer based out of Massachusetts. And she'd done a colorway called Narcissa Malfoy, and it was about 120 inches in each color repeat. So it was a very short color repeat, which meant that when you crocheted the sock, the yarn was changing color in each row, which was beautiful because you really could see the details of the what I call the wave stitch, and I like the name much more than single crochet V stitch. Waves sounds much better. And they really did look like waves when you alternate colors in every row. So obviously if you do not have a fingering weight yarn that has such sh short color repeats, then you can of course just use two yarn colors and alternate them in every row. That worked really well. Um, Tamara from Crafty Escapism did that. Emma from Potter and Plume did that as well. And I know that uh, Caroline from Mind and Muse Crafts wants to do that as well. And it will be much easier than you're probably thinking because the foot of the sock is worked in a spiral. So you wouldn't have to cut your yarn or anything like that. You could just drop it, continue one yarn, and then pick up the other yarn. But these socks were made in a much more commercially available yarn. I got it at Joann's and it's Lion Brand's Mani Petty in the yoga color. And you can see it's hanging off the sock blocker because I've already worn them. So after I did my little photo shoot with these socks, I wore them for the entire day so they were on my feet for 12 hours and you can see how baggy they got just um width wise which now looks lengthwise but you can see the stitches and how they've just flattened out they're not as happy as the stitches on the top part of the foot but you can also see that the wave stitch, you cannot really appreciate it in this sock because the color changes are 
I mean, sorry, the color repeats are very long. So I don't even know how this would work up in knitting because usually in crochet, because of the way you work the stitch, you tend to use the yarn differently, which means that your um, color repeats tend to be shorter, which is why self-striping yarn doesn't usually work in crochet. It really depends on what stitch you're using and how long you're working around. Um, but these color repeats are just so long that I imagine if you knit with them, you would actually have huge blocks of color, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But when you're trying to show off the detail of a stitch, it's a, I'm a little bit bugged by it, but not enough that I wouldn't use the yarn again to crochet socks. Um, if you want to read more details about what the changes I had to make to the sock to be able to work it with the Manny Petty yarn, then I'm going to link the blog post down below. I did have to adjust the number of rounds that I used for the sock because the Manny Petty yarn was a bit thicker. So that also meant that I had to go up a hook size. Typically, I crochet my socks using a three millimeter hook, which I still did use for the toe because when I made the toe, that's when I noticed that the fabric was coming out way too thick. But in hindsight, I don't know if that would have been completely bad. I would actually have to purchase more of this yarn and crochet it all with a three millimeter hook just to let you know. But I really think the fabric would have just been so thick that it, they would have turned out more like slippers which there's nothing wrong with that. I love wearing socks around the house. I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I just love being cozy around the house. The other project that I have is not really a finished object because I'm still missing to weave in my ends. And you know, I don't remember if I ever showed this to you guys, but this was my first attempt at designing a vintage flower square blanket and this is actually the original pattern as it's written for the flower square that I've been sharing with you recently I adapted the pattern um, I took out two rows I think so it's short it's um, not as wide this is 13 by 13 and of course the yarn I'm using, it's Erin or worsted weight yarn, so it's not as big as this Bernat Softy Chunky, which is a super bulky yarn. I used an eight millimeter hook to crochet these squares, and this blanket is too big to share it with you guys on camera. But I did a granny stitch border, um, and I essentially picked up this project again because I wanted to figure out how I was going to sew my squares together for the actual cotton blanket that I'm working up and what border I wanted to use. And I really like that I used a granny stitch border for this blanket. Um, I don't know if the reason I like it is because this full size square has some gaps the one of the final rows you chain two, skip two, so you get a sort of filet crochet effect. And the granny stitch, you, of course, if you're familiar with it, you have holes in it as well. So I think it complements the blanket very well. I don't know if I can say the same for the um, modified version of this square. But what I was thinking of doing is that maybe instead of just sewing it together using slip stitches, which is what I did here, I could do a round of single crochets in white, which is the color I'm going to be, well it's a cream, it's called whipped cream, it's the color I'm going to be using to sew them all together, then maybe it'll be okay to sew in slip stitches because the different colors won't be as obvious because you're doing a round of the white and you're also sewing together in the white. I did buy three balls of the Lion Brand Comfy Cotton, which is the yarn I'm gonna be using to sew all these together or at least make the border. 
and I do hope that it's enough. To make this border here, I did three rounds of granny stitch and I used three balls of the taupe color and this is also Bernat Softy Chunky. The main blanket, if you're looking, it's um, an aqua color. So I wanted to make it kind of look like a beach theme. That was the original intention behind making this blanket. Uh, I don't have a lot of ends. I mean, I have, there are four squares total and I have a middle end and then when you finish, so then I have this ends that I've used to sew. Yeah. If you want any more details about this stitch, then I do have a tutorial on it and I also did a blog post on this stitch. So basically to crochet the stitch, you start out in the middle working in the round and then you square it off and you keep working your granny, I call it the granny effect because it doesn't really use granny stitch but it does the increases in the corners just like a granny square would. So part of me is debating whether to use the granny stitch as a border or whether to go with something like a v-stitch border which would still use the increases in the corner uh, but would make it just a bit more open and airy because this is a very open and flimsy square. Right. So I really just need to get cracking on this blanket, which, you know, if I am asked to work from home or the job closes for any amount of time, I've told myself that I at least need to work on two squares a day because I only bought two um, balls of each color. So I have five colors, so that's 10 squares. It's not a very big blanket, Clarissa Beth. Not at all. Although I do think that with the amount of yarn left, I could potentially um, start squares and finish them in the white, which is the other thing I was considering is having solid colored squares, but then having squares until I run out of yarn that use this little ends and are white. And that would make a bigger lap blanket and I could kind of like play with how I place the colors. But I don't know, I'm, I'm the type of person that I can't visualize my finished blanket. I have to finish all the squares and then see how I want to place them, which is Sometimes a little bit annoying because I would like to get to the actual sewing part of the blanket. So anyway, those are my two almost finished objects and one semi work in progress because I haven't really worked on it that I have going on. Um, the other project that I have going on are some socks as well. These are my husband's socks. They're still on my hook. Yes, I haven't finished them. I did finish one of them though, so I'm going to take one guy off the sock blocker and I'm going to show you guys the finished one which I believe I did in the previous episode but anyway I'm still going to share it with you because it's huge it's too huge for uh, the sock blocker width wise um, this is a 48 stitch sock I think it would fit me comfortably maybe a little too loose but I think a 40 stitch sock might be too tight unless I just start it with a 40, doing 40 stitch, increase, 42 stitches on the toe and then increasing slowly until I get to um, 48 or 56 stitches and then do my heel. We'll see. These socks were designed in lace weight yarn and they were designed specifically for my husband because he's gotten to the point where he just wants handmade socks. He specifically told me, I don't care if they're crochet or knit, I want handmade socks. <laughs> so um, I decided to take him up on that challenge and make him a pair of crochet socks, which I know are super, super finicky when you're making it for somebody else but he does live with me so I can measure 
um, I can tr he can try them on and I did make him stand still and trace his foot and write down my measurements so I have that template as well. Now in terms of my second sock I am now going to start my gusset increases for the heel and then I will do my heel flap, my heel turn and I will just do a very short leg. As you can see from the pattern it's just got um, nine rows of leg before I did my camel stitch cuff. And I'm crocheting these socks on a beautiful, beautiful gift that I got for my birthday. And this is a hand turned almond wood hook crafted by Mr. Stitchcraft and Wizardry. And it is Gorgeous. It's a 2.5 millimeter. This one was their birthday gift to me because I had ordered an almond hook um, from them. It was a 3 millimeter almond hook. So you can see I've got my two sock crochet hooks from Stitchcraft and Wizardry. And I couldn't be happier. The hook feels so beautiful on my hand. It's so soft. It's the natural wood. There's only a little bit of a beeswax a coating, I believe, just to make it softer. But oh, it's just so, so beautiful. Now, I have written up a tutorial for the linked double crochet stitch. You can find it on my blog as well as here on YouTube. And I will hopefully be publishing this blog post on Saturday, next Saturday. So today is Sunday, the 22nd of March. So next Saturday, this sock pattern will be live. And I know a lot of you have been asking me for it. And I can't blame you because the prospect of making crochet socks with lace weight yarn and having it feel a little bit closer to a knit sock is very tempting. It's very tempting. Now the yarn I got from Crafted and Treats, I believe I've mentioned that a lot of times before because I've been working on these socks for a while. But it's her lace and nylon base, 80% Coriadil Pullworth wool and 20% nylon. She still has her shop open if you are interested as well as Stitchcraft and Wizardry. They also have their shop open so you can order yarn from them if you so wish. And gotta say you won't regret it because not only did I purchase a hook from them, I also got yarn, which I'll share with you a little bit later because I do have one other project that I'm working on. Although technically it's been two projects. Hang on a second. I also have a, another project that I finished and I forgot to bring. So the other object I finished is a pot holder and this pot holder is made using the thermal stitch which I had no idea existed but I'm very very happy that I know it exists now because it is a super super thick stitch that makes excellent pot holders. It really does. I also think it, it would make great purses because you wouldn't really have to line them. There are no holes here. The ends are woven in, that's just a stray end that I have to cut, <laughs> but there are no holes in this fabric. Oh, I first saw the thermal stitch, um, Sorella, she was the one that um, designed these simple pot holders and she also did a stitch tutorial for it. And that was the first time I'd ever seen this stitch and I'm super, super happy I came across it uh, because the heat doesn't really get through this baby. So I crocheted this using two strands of cotton yarn, which is what she recommends in her pattern. She uses Lion Brand Re-Up yarn. I just had some Premier Cotton something yarn, so that's what I used. Two strands held together and a 6.5 millimeter hook. The hook I used was a hook nook hook. I was trying them out and I, I don't know how I feel about them. They are, just, um, I guess, typical plastic hooks. So there's a bit of a factor going on there, but the length of it, 
I'll be right back. I'm just gonna go get it and show you guys. Yeah, we're super professional here at the Crochet Cakes podcast. So anyway, this is the hook. This is from the Hook Nook, as I've mentioned, and it is a very long hook. And I do love the thumb rest. My thumb rests perfectly in this hook, but I, I'm not crazy about the acrylic feel of the hook. It just feels like a hook that would come in a crochet kit. And I know some people are super comfortable using plastic hooks. And like I said, I do love the length of it. I like where my thumb rests. I just don't know that I like, I don't know, I like the colors. Oh, they're just so bright. But anyway, so let's compare because I have the, this is a 6.5 millimeter hook and I also have the same hook in my Clover Amours. So you can see this hook is significantly longer than the Clover Amour hook, which does make it very comfortable when you're crocheting. It feels a bit more balanced and the shape of the hook also feels very well balanced. In terms of plastic, the plastic in the Clover Amours, it's much smoother and it is a lot more pleasant to crochet with. It doesn't feel like it's sticking to the yarn so much. It's a buttery plastic, if that makes sense. This one feels like a bit of harsher plastic. Um, I don't really know how to describe it. I'm the worst at describing things. So you, I guess you really just have to buy one. I'll put a link down below to both of these hooks so you can, if you want, you can compare yourself. I think I got this one, I got this one in Amazon for $3 and this one at Joann's for $9.99 but I had a coupon so it actually came out to be $7. If you buy them, both of these hooks at Joann's, the prices are comparable. But I think the Clover Amour is a much better quality hook. I just really, really love the balance of the hook nook hook. And I love the thumb rest, as I said, and the length of it. So I think I'm going to buy another hook that I would use normally and just give it a go because there are some redeeming qualities to this hook. Keep, just keep watching. Um, but back to the pot holder. So I used my hook nook hook to crochet the pot holder. So I think that's why it took such a long time. But this is the thermal stitch. It's a very easy stitch. It's essentially single crochet. And when you first start, you work it in the back loop only. And then when you come back around, you work in the back loop of the single crochet and the loop that you left on worked in the row below. So it's a, a double stitch essentially. Now, the other work in progress that I have, oop, I think I dropped it, is my Six Wives shawl. Now, this is a shawl that's designed by Emma from Potter and Bloom, and she designed it based on the Six Wives of Henry VIII. Now, this little wormy, curly thing that you see here is the shawl, I kid you not. I'm gonna open it up so you guys can see this is the shawl. Yes, it is. And I am crocheting it using a much hoarded yarn in my stash. This is the Solstice colorway from Vine. You can see that it is crocheting up in little splotches of color that just group together. I wouldn't call this pooling, but... Um, the colors are not as sparse as when you see in the cake, but this is essentially a cream base with speckles of brown, blues, grays, and taupes. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous color. I've been hoarding it, like I said, for a while because Woolen Vine yarns, right? They're so sought after and her colorways are really, really pretty as well. And this yarn, is in her MCN base, so it's merino cashmere nylon, 
which, you know, it's, it's not that great for socks. You can use cashmere for socks, um, but I don't find that they hold up, up, up super well. Although, I don't know if my brother uses his socks for his feet, so I couldn't really say because he was the only one that got... No, no, I lied. My sister also got... She got wool, silk, and cashmere socks. Um, and those lasted for two years before they got a hole in them. And she loved them so much that she kept using them until there's a hole this big at the bottom of the, of the foot and then this big at the bottom of the heel. I would have to perform, perform some big surgery on that sock. Um, so we'll see if I have any yarn that I can actually do that with for, for her because she gave them back to me hoping that I could fix them because she loved them. Who knows? But anyway, this is my version of the Six Wives shawl. The reason, um, the main body of the shawl is meant to remind us of Catherine of Aragon, who was Henry VIII's first wife, first wife. And I chose this color because the main base of it is cream. And Catherine of Aragon, for all her age, was very innocent when she was first married to Henry VIII. Um, she still believed in the goodwill of the King Henry VII, and she was just innocent, even though she was a lot older than Henry. So I wanted to use those colors to represent her because the cream is meant to represent her innocence and then the little splotches of darker colors to represent the troubled times that she lived with uh, when her first husband, Henry's brother, died and nobody knew what to do with her. So that's why I chose those colors. The rest of the colors are whoop, still not caked up and I've got them here. <laughs> so I don't know how I'm going to work it up, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to use the darker color right after bleh. Sorry, the darker color right after the Catherine of Aragorn because the dark color would be Anne Boylan. She had really, really dark hair, and I'm using the color to represent her hair, not her personality. Um, some people don't like her. She was very cunning and she knew what she wanted out of life. And I think those are qualities that you should also appreciate in somebody. So I'm using the black to represent her. I haven't decided what color to use to represent Jane Seymour. Um, because I still have these left. And I still need to represent Jane Seymour, Catherine Howard, and then Catherine Parr, or Catherine Parr, and then Catherine, I don't remember. There were too many Catherines. Yeah. So I've got all these colors that I need to assign, or, you know, I might actually not use this black one and use one of these darker blues to represent Catherine because I feel it goes a bit better. Maybe something like this. I don't know. I still have time to think about it. I have a long way to crochet. But I am crocheting this while listening to The Six Wives of Henry VIII by Alison Weir. This one is not a um, historical fiction. It's just fact. It's a book based on the lives of just kind of introduce you to the six wives of Henry VIII a little bit behind their personality, who they were, and how they got to be his wife, essentially. So that's the Six Wives Shawl. I, that's all the works in progress I have to share with you today. I do have some little bit of acquisitions to share with you. Um, one of them was that Clover Moorhook and others are birthday presents for myself. Some of them were given to me and some of them I bought. But I only, I'm only sharing the crochet related ones. So uh, my mom, she bought me Dora Orenstein's book, uh, which I love. I love because this book 
It's a stitch dictionary, you know, as you could see in the title. And it gives you the stitches, the basic pattern of the stitches, how you would increase the stitch and how you would decrease the stitch. And if you're working it in a garment, how would you do the internal shaping of the stitch? So it's a very in-depth stitch dictionary. And I think this is a great tool to have in your arsenal. Um, I don't think you would ever get tired of it. And just by looking at the back cover and the front cover, you can see that she's done the basic increasing, decreasing, and then internal shaping for every single stitch. And I have begun reading the book because I've started this thing now that I don't just pick up a book and head straight to the patterns that I like. I'm reading the inspiration behind the book and the idea behind the book. So while reading it, Dora Orenstein, she says that she just played a lot with stitches to figure out ways of increasing in the same stitch pattern, decreasing and shaping internally. Um, so that's how she came about with all of these variations was by just picking up the basic pattern and doing her experiments, learning how the stitch leans, what tendencies does the stitch curl when it's worked flat, how would you avoid it curling, uh, does it work differently in the round? How could you get it to work in the round? Things like that. And she is such an inspiration because she just says that she played around with all of the stitches and that's how she was able to work how to shape them. And I think that's really valuable information. So based on this, I've sort of been collecting stitch dictionaries recently vintage or otherwise, because if I want to become a garment designer, I need to play with the stitches a lot. I need to know what they work up flat, how they work up in the round, how to play with them to get the stitches to do what I want. And apparently the way to do so is just by working up as many swatches for the stitches as you can, which is something I tend to shy away from. Um, so I got myself this. Uh, the Basic Stitch Dictionary by Erica Knight. It includes 250 crochet stitches. It was by Interweave Press. So maybe you can find it on Interweave. I don't know. I got this off of Better World Books. It's an old library book and it's very, very well used. But it's got stitches that the Dora Ornstein book doesn't have. They're only written in they only have the written instructions. There's no increasing, decreasing or whatever. But if I practice Dora's theory enough, I should be able to come up with the own increasing and decreasing. And you also have a sample and then the chart. Um, this of course is written in, oh. You know, I was gonna say that it's written in UK terms but it's not it says one single crochet into each of the next four single crochets so that's us terms makes my life just a little bit easier um dora ornstein is also worked in us terms again my life is just a little bit easier um and yarn wise i purchased yarn from stitchcraft and wizardry because i love her colorways and I just, I treated myself. So I got a little set. This is a sock set. I have the Hercule Boivre colorway. It's from the Classic Crimes dye collection. And it is a light yellow base with some speckling or color variations of brownish yellow, gold, mustard yellow, and light yellows all sprinkled throughout. There's even some tiny splotches of pinks in here. And I'm going, the sock contrasting color is a tonal brown and it's in their 85% superwash merino and 15% nylon base so it's really soft and squishy and the main color is in their princess jasmine colorway so it's 80% superwash merino 10% cashmere and 10% nylon Okay. 
And the other yarn I purchased is to make a little bear for my coworker. My coworker gave me a Joann's gift card for my birthday, which she really didn't have to do, and I wanted to pay her back um, by doing something nice for her, as her birthday is also coming up this week, but I wanted to do something extra special, and I know um, she hasn't really asked me to crochet anything, but I know she would really, really appreciate it if I crocheted something for her daughter. So I got some Bernat Baby Velvet, uh, just one ball, and I'm going to make a little teddy bear. I'm excited actually to start it. And the teddy bear pattern that I'm going to make is, I'll link it down below, because I don't remember, I don't want to butcher the person's name, but it's a free Amigurumi pattern. So. I want to get started on that this week after I finish the socks. So today, after my baking endeavors and after I edit this podcast, my plans are just to crochet. Um, but yes, I. that is all the crafty... Sorry about that, guys. I forgot my phone was on. Content I have for... <laughs> That is all the crafty content I have to share with you. The other thing I guess is what I'm reading and I already told you I'm reading The Six Wives of Henry VIII but I'm also reading a book that I have misplaced. Ah, here it is. I am reading Animal, Vegetable, and Miracle by Barbara Kingslover, and it's just kind of a diary of this family's experience with growing their own food for an entire year or trying to eat as locally as possible, and it's just really interesting. I'm, I'm really enjoying learning about their journey to become a self-sufficient farm, I guess, and I know uh, that's also something Kat Golden does. Um, her and her family, they live on a farm in Scotland. And speaking of Kat, I know how many of us have gone down the sourdough journey? I fell into it again, but I had been missing it for a while and I had been meaning to get back to it for a while. And I know Catherine from Craft and Treats has gone on the sourdough black hole. I believe I've tempted my sister into dabbling into the dark arts of sourdough as well. So how many out there are into the sourdough madness and how many of you are baking your stress away? But thank you so much for sharing a little bit of time with me this week. I hope I've made you feel just a little bit less alone and less isolated. And of course, comment down below. I read all the comments and I comment on all the comments. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed but would like to be, then you can hit the subscribe button. It's free of charge and I am going, I have plans to keep posting content in my channel not just podcasts, but also tutorials. Like I said, my life is not just not that interesting to be able to vlog every single day. I kind of wish it was, but I guess you just have to have that vlogging mentality of recording everything you do. And I forget, I do things and I'm like, oh, oh, I guess I should have recorded that. So it's just, it's, I guess it's just not me, right? Some things you know are you, like this haircut. This haircut is definitely me and I am loving it. And some things you know aren't you, like bananas. I don't really like bananas. I used to love them when I was little, but yeah. I know that I haven't mentioned the winner of the giveaway and that's because I, I haven't had the time to sew a project bag and to dig through my stash and see how else I'm going to bulk up the package just to provide that little bit of happiness. So I will be announcing the winner for my birthday giveaway in two weeks time from this podcast without fail. 
I promise. I just, I really want to make this giveaway special because it's my way of saying thank you and sharing my birthday love and also just my way of cheering you up during this time. I really, really want to be able to do that. And speaking of, to the person who commented on, left me actually a message, private message on my blog that you wanted the Slytherin jumper, I have not been able to reply to you. Every time I reply to your email, it says it's the account doesn't exist. So if this is a mistake, then please comment down here, down here, and I will Actually, that wouldn't really work because I wouldn't want you to put your email. So please comment down here with an alternate alternate way of contacting you. If you have Ravelry, put your Ravelry name. If you have Instagram, put your Instagram name. I just want to be able to get this um, sweater out to you, okay? Well, that is it for me today. This was a very long episode and happy crafting. Bye. <laughs>